guys all for coming. I know that you're um, busy. If you work at UBHC, you're, you probably have, you know, 15,000 things waiting for you when you go back to your office, but I appreciate that you came out this morning. Um, today we're going to have a, um, a presentation by Dr. Susie Millar. She's a program... <laughs> She brought her own cheering section. Um, she's a program manager of school and community-based programs here at UBHC. She's in Edison right now, but also will be in Piscataway soon. Um, her team, you might not know this, but, or you might, but if you don't, you should. Um, her team in Edison created and implemented a mindfulness curriculum for school-aged youth, um, which they have uh, created a manual that's very usable, so <clears throat> reach out to Dr. Millar if you want more information about that or her team. Maybe you can give a little shout out to who we should call. Um, and actually that project will be presented at the APA conference in August in San Francisco, so congratulations to the Edison team for that. Um, but back to Dr. Millar, she did her dissertation research at Marywood University on Arab immigrants, and she was looking specifically at religious and generational differences in stress reaction and coping. Um, and so as a natural progression today, she's going to talk with us about considerations related to counseling with Arab Americans. And I give you Dr. Susie Millar. Okay, so I know that sometimes my voice doesn't project very well. I will not be at all offended if you guys tell me to speak up. So please do, because I want to make sure that you can hear me. Um, what? <laughs> Um, does anybody know who this is? Mom guy. Tony Shalhoub. So actually, he's a uh, Lebanese American. I know a lot of times we don't really realize this because, as we'll start talking about, there's really no um, identifying factors of Arab Americans in terms of the physical appearance. So sometimes people don't know where they are, who they, where they come from, per se. Okay. So the goal for today is to improve the psychological well-being of the Arab American population. Um, so our objective will be to describe at least three demographic variables that are specific to the population, identify at least two culturally sensitive therapeutic skills, and commit to um, using at least two of these skills in our therapeutic work with the immigrant population. So without looking at your slides, <laughs> what are some common misperceptions that you may have heard about the Arabs? They're all Muslim. They're all Muslim. They wear turbans. They wear turbans. What else have you heard? Nothing? They're very conservative. They're very conservative in terms of dress, in terms of their patterns, absolutely, yeah. Okay, so all Arabs are Muslims. That's one that we hear a lot, right? Um, the word Arab and Muslim are interchangeable. So if you're an Arab, you're a Muslim. If you're a Muslim, you must be an Arab. Arabs live in deserts. Um, in the tents and ride around using camels. <laughs> I still hear that. Um, Arabs hate Jews. We heard that. All Arab women have to wear a scarf. <clears throat> so if we assume that Arabs are Muslim, then all Arab women must have to wear a scarf. Um, Arab women have no rights. Uh, Islam is violent. And Arabs are terrorists. Have we heard most of these? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and their religion intolerant. So we assume that they're all Muslim, and Muslims must be religion intolerant, so they don't approve of any other religion. So who are the Arab Americans? A lot of the times when we think of Arab Americans, if we're assuming they're Muslim, then this might be what we think of. But these are Arab Americans, and these are Arab Americans, and these are Arab Americans. So there's really no um, physical identifying factor of what an Arab American looks like. So Arab Americans consist of individuals who come from 22 different countries throughout Southwest Asia, Northern Africa, and the Middle East. So those are countries from Egypt, Algeria, Lib um, Libya, Morocco, Saudi Arabia. So it really varies. And because there's so many different countries, again, it's really hard to identify physical factors that make them Arab. So it really has to do with the fact that all Arabs um, speak the common language of Arabic. That's the main identifying factor. Within that, there's a lot of different dialects. So someone may, from Saudi Arabia may not necessarily immediately understand someone who's from Egypt, because their dialects are <coughs> that different, but they all learn the same common language of Arab, Arab, Arabic. 
So the Arab Americans immigrated to the United States in three major waves starting in the 1890s. And the first major wave was predominantly Christian. They tended to be less educated. And they were able to acculturate a little bit more easily because they're Christian coming into a predominantly Christian society in the United States. Um, and they were able to uh, acculturate into that culture because they didn't really have any identifying physical characteristics that really um, singled them out. The later um, waves, late into the 20th century, tended to be more Muslim and a lot more educated. And they tended to have a little bit more difficult time acculturating because of the differences in the um, religious um, culture that they were coming into. So according to the 2010 US Census, there's about 1.7 million Arabs in the United States. We believe that that number is significantly low because when you look at the US Census in 2010, there was no opportunity to identify yourself as an Arab American. So Arab Americans were told to identify themselves as white, which is very inaccurate. So um, the Arab American Institute kind of did their own little survey, and they estimate it to be closer to about 3.5 million Arabs. And that was back in 2010. So as we know, there's definitely been an increase in the number of Arab Americans coming to the country. So that number is probably significantly higher. And the Arab American Institute has been working very hard on identifying a Arab American um, identification on the next US Census, which should be coming up pretty soon. So we'll see where we're at then. I should have mentioned this before, but feel free to interrupt throughout if you have any questions. I'm not set on you having to wait to ask questions at the end. So where do the Arab Americans live? This kind of gives us an idea of which states they tend to populate to um, based on the percentage of the total population. So you can see in New Jersey, um, it's one of the higher populated states in terms of the Arab Americans by um, total population of the state. Um, so in New Jersey, there's about, and this was back in uh, 2000, 2000, 2010, they didn't really um, update the numbers, but they were looking at about 108,000 um, U.S. Im uh, Arab immigrants at that time. And again, because we're pretty sure that the numbers are low due to the fact that they couldn't really identify themselves, that number is probably significantly higher. And that's out of the 8.6 million uh, New Jersey residents at that time. So we can see that the number of Arab um, immigrants within the New Jersey tends to in, tended to increase over the uh, year 2000 to 2013. So by 2013, again, we said there was about 108. And again, I do believe that that number is significantly higher. So where are they living? They're really in all the different counties within New Jersey. <coughs> these are the top five counties. And we can see that Middlesex is about fourth. Um, they tend to uh, go to areas that are more Am I closer. Okay, sorry about that. They tend to go to areas that have more job opportunities. A lot of these people are coming with um, with a lot of education, but unfortunately, their degrees don't um, don't transfer over. So we'll get into a little bit more. But a lot of times, you'll find people immigrating who were doctors or engineers in their countries and then they come to the United States and they have to work as gas station attendants because their degrees don't transfer over and language barriers um, prevent them from being able to pursue getting their degree right away. Okay. So this gives us an idea um, in terms of which country of origin the U.S. immigrants or the Arab immigrants have been coming into within New Jersey. So more recently, there's been more of an um, increase in the Egyptian Arab immigrants that have been coming to the country. And they tend to find um, individuals from their own country that have already immigrated and then tend to immigrate to those same areas. So right now, there's a large Egyptian population in New Jersey, and that leads to an increase in Egyptian immigrants coming, because they know that that's where they'll find resources, they'll find supports, they'll find people that understand them. So again, without looking too much at your PowerPoint, um, what are you? What have you guys heard as some reasons for why they immigrate? <laughs> Employment opportunities. Employment opportunities, absolutely. Education. Education. Anybody else? 
like acceptance of their religion where they're immigrating to? Absolutely. So if we, well, I'm sure we've heard that in a lot of Arab countries, they do tend to be a little bit more religion intolerant. Um, so coming to this country for religious freedoms is something that definitely happens quite a bit. Maybe more safety? Safety, absolutely. Okay. So for economic reasons, um, they tend to believe that there's a lot more money to be attained in America. If they have family members who live in America, they expect you to send money over to them because they do believe that you're making a lot more and you're much more well off in the United States than you would be in their country. Um, they've come to flee political conflict, so again, for more safety. Religious persecution, so if they're being persecuted in their own countries because of their religion, we know that the United States has a lot more religious freedom, so they tend to come to the United States to attain that. Flee sectarian conflict, so that e means even between the same religious groups, they may be fleeing because if one religious group is predominant in their own country, then it still feels very unsafe for them improved standard of living, which unfortunately doesn't always happen and they don't realize that. A lot of times I'll hear about Arab immigrants who come from their own countries where they were living very wealthy lives, they owned companies, they had um, people who drove them around and people who would cook for them and they come here and they're working again as gas station attendants and they um, aren't able to care for their families at the same level that they were used to. And that can be very difficult for the family to adjust to educational experiences, mostly for their children. A lot of families will make the sacrifice and come here in order for their children to have more educational opportunities because the degrees don't transfer over from their own countries. Money grows on trees. They still believe this. Um, we have family members in Arab countries who still believe that we are, um, we have more money than we know what to do with and that's why they have that expectation. You must be doing well off because you live in the United States they expect that you care for them. Um, turmoil and violence within their country of origin. And again, this goes back to that safety piece. So within the, U, um, the Arab countries, there's two predominant religions, Christianity and Islam. So the majority of Arabs in the United States tend to be Christians. Um, However, within the Arab countries, the majority of um, Arabs tend to be Muslim. So a lot of the uh, Christians that are in the Arab countries will come to the United States for that religious freedom. Islam is the second largest religion of the Arab immigrants. So because, again, we mentioned Arab were persecuted for their religious preferences, so they come here to receive more religious freedoms. Um, so when it comes to Islam, again, a lot of people assume that Islam is violent, that Muslims are terrorists, because of some of the things that have happened um, throughout the world within the past um, 20, 30, or so years. But ultimately, Islam is at its core. The word Islam means peace, and the term Muslim is one who practices peace. So uh, it's really those radical Muslims that are the ones that are initiating all of these um, situations that occur around the state of the world, really. And it gives the entire Muslim population this um, presentation of they must be terrorists, they must be wanting to kill and persecute others when ultimately they just want to live these peaceful lives. Okay. So within the Christian um, population, there's a number of different religions throughout the Arab um, Americans. Roman Catholic is about 35%, Protestant is 10%. Eastern Orthodox is about 18%, and then other is 13%. Um, the Muslims, which are typically three different sects, the Sunni, the Shia, and the Druze, are about 20% of the Arab immigrant population. So when it comes to being Arab, it's not just a race, it's a cultural perspective. So they really take their Arab culture and their religion, and it becomes their way of living. Um, it, it helps them in terms of identifying the way they perceive the world, the way they look at things. Um, so it really becomes a worldview for them. Their identity is really built around their religious practices. So their perceptions, their attitudes, their values, their beliefs are all dictated by the religious preference that they have. Um, a lot of Arab immigrants, regardless of religion, truly believe that mental health is caused by, and physical ailments are caused by um, 
maybe struggles within their faith. So they believe that they must have done something wrong within their faith. They must have um, sinned against God in order for them to be experiencing these, these ailments. So it's identified very internally like I must have done something wrong. And the family really perceives it in a very similar way. Such a quiet crowd today. <laughs> Okay, so the role of the Arab um, American family. Arab Americans are a collectivistic society, which is very different than the American individualistic society. So what that means is they really value that, um, that uh, sense of family. Decisions are made by involving the whole family. The family unit is very important. And when I say family unit, it's not just the immediate family. This includes grandparents and aunts and uncles. And they're very close to their families. A lot of times you'll find them living together or very close to each other. And um, there's no secrets within the family. However, outside of that family, they really like to protect their privacy. So it's very difficult when it's seeking out mental health services because they're then required to share their family secrets. And that's very uncomfortable for them. So they really like to keep that within the family. The father is the head of the household, but the mother has a lot of responsibility placed on her. So it's the mom's responsibility to ensure that the family continues to maintain their values, that the children are performing as they should, and uh, her prestige really comes from how her family is perceived. Children are still expected to remain in the family home until marriage. Even if the children go off to college, they don't just continue to live on their own. They still come back and they return to the family home until marriage. It doesn't matter how old they are. So they could be 40, 50. They're still living with their families until they're married. And a lot of times you'll even see that they will get married and they'll continue to live with the grandparents. So they tend to place a lot of value on living or being close to that family unit. They tend to place a lot of importance on um, taking care of the elderly. So as their parents get older, it's, it's very important for them. It's a prestige issue to be able to care for their loved ones. They're not sending them to nursing homes because then they feel like they're not taking that responsibility on themselves. Regardless of how sick their, um, their parents may be, they want to keep them in that family home and take care of them themselves. Seeking out into it. Yes? I'm just curious. Can you say, in the previous slide, you said that um, a lot of times Mental health and physical ailments are sort of seen as like a religious or spiritual weakness. When you're thinking about the family, does it then sort of stand to reason that parents might look at the physical ailments of their children as, is it the child's fault, sort of, or is it like the parent looks at that as if it's their fault? Well, that's a great question. So again, because we said that the woman is really perceived as the one who's responsible for the family, it becomes the mother's responsibility. And if the child has a physical ailment or if the child has mental health issues, the fault is on the mother, that she didn't care for the child or she didn't raise the child correctly, so it becomes her responsibility. And the father places a lot of blame on the mother for not raising the child correctly. So that's the one time where it's not the child's fault, it's the parent's fault, the mother in particular's fault for not raising them in the way that's correct. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Both of you. Uh, no, just as a, an anecdote to that, I once worked with um, a girl from Pakistan who was visually impaired, and it was so interesting to see the it was absolutely the mother's moral failing that caused the child to have this impairment. And so that really, it was problematic because what do you do in terms of that value system within that family, how do you work with that? Because that's their understanding of, of the situation, right? Um, but it caused a tremendous amount of guilt and shame for everybody. And then you add on any other mental health pieces to it, it was, it was very problematic. Absolutely. So I'm just curious, do they only reach out to family members for that support as a parent? So typically they'll reach out, in the initially immediate family, so, and, and again, when I say immediate, that includes grandparents, aunts, uncles, so they'll reach out to that family unit, and if they can't resolve it amongst themselves, they'll reach out to a religious leader first, so that becomes the first line of defense. And um, only then will they reach out to a medical professional. And it's a lot easier, which we'll be getting into a little bit later, to focus more on the physical piece. So if I can fix it by taking a pill, then that feels a lot less threatening than focusing on that emotional piece, because that means feelings, and that makes it a lot more sticky for them. So it's a lot easier to say, well, I'm having um, high blood pressure, 
because of my anxiety so then I can take a pill and just fix that or I'm having back pain or I'm having stomach pain that feels a lot more accessible to them um, to handle in terms of their mindset than to say well I'm feeling anxiety or I'm feeling depressed that just feels much more selfish than to just handle the physical piece. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, in regards to um, the physical illness, mental health being treated like religious weakness, is there a difference between a Muslim Arab and a Christian Arab as far as how they do that? No, they both do that. They both believe that it has something to do with a um, with a moral um, weakness that they're having. They both kind of go take it back to that, and they'll seek out their imam or they'll seek out their pastor um, or priest to be able to support them through that situation. That's a good question. Any other questions? Um, so we said individualistic pursuits, so really seeking your own plans and your own goals for yourself is seen as selfish instead of focusing on the family. Now that doesn't mean that they don't value education, in fact education is very, um, very important to them and the child being educated and the re child receiving good grades is of utmost importance and the parents tend to put a lot of pressure on the child. We immigrated to this country for you so you can have a good education. So if the child's not doing and performing well in school, that puts a lot of pressure on the child and the family really perceives that as um, the child is being selfish and not supporting the family unit. So um, that's not perceived as being um, individualistic to seek out your own educational pursuits. That's seen as increasing the family prestige and that's very important to them. And even with it, within education, if you're not a doctor, an, an engineer, a lawyer, something of utmost uh, importance to the culture, then they still perceive it as, well, you didn't accomplish as much as you could have, and you didn't bring as much prestige to the family. And again, that's put on the mother as, well, why didn't you raise children who have accomplished more? Um, okay, so disruption of family constellation. So a lot of times, they can't afford to all move here together. So sometimes you'll see a father will move here alone and be sending money back to his family to support them until he can bring them here. Or if they do all come, then you have like the mother, the, the father, and their children, and they're leaving behind grandparents and aunts and uncles. And that really does disrupt that family unit because of how important the whole family system is to them, which puts a lot of family, um, puts a lot of distress on the family because they're losing that support system that's so valuable to them. So we started talking a little bit about the um, Arab American woman. So it is a male dominant social structure, but again, the woman's social status is really contingent on how her family is perceived. So when, you, um, when you're growing up, it's all about, okay, you need to have a good education, even though they don't expect you to work with your education. They want you to have a great education. So become a doctor, become a lawyer, become an engineer. And then you haven't accomplished enough until you are married and you have a husband. And then you haven't accomplished enough until you have a child. And you haven't accomplished enough until your child is successful and your child has gotten a good education and gotten a good degree. And even then, it's, well, has your child had children of their own? So the, fam the mother's prestige is really, really focused on how, how does her family, um, how is her family viewed in um, society? And they're constantly looking for more. So they're never satisfied with what the woman has done. She's always looked to, to accomplish more, to have more. Are her grandchildren doing well? Are her um, children working um, good jobs? Are, did they get a good education? So she's always looked to, to make sure that her family is perceived well in terms of society. It's common for women to not have um, careers outside of the home, even though they have great educations and they may be working as doctors or lawyers or engineers or accountants, and then once they have children, they're expected to leave their employment and go and live in, um, and become stay-at-home moms and take care of their children until their children are old enough. And even then, they feel like the responsibilities of caring for a family might feel so large that they don't return back to their employment until much later. Um, this seems to be shifting a, a, a slight bit, but it's still very much how um, women are, are expected to, um, to be within the family. So even though more women are seeking these um, careers as a way of being able to fulfill something for themselves, it's still perceived as somewhat selfish and they are expected to be more so focused on their families. So again, women are seen as the tradition bearers. So when they bring their culture into the United States, it's very important for the mother to be able to make sure that her family maintains that. 
So if the children become too acculturated, which I keep talking about that word, I promise we'll get to it. Um, if the children are seen as being coming too comfortable with the American culture, that's perceived negatively against the mother because she's not able to maintain their culture and bring it to the new country with her. So this is a question I get quite a bit. There's a lot of different headscarves that you may have heard of in terms of Arab women and what they use. So this just kind of gives you an idea of the different types of headscarves. There's no set, this is one that's typically used in this country. You can really see a lot of different ones within the same country. Um, you could be walking down the same street in Egypt and see women wearing three different types of headscarves. So the type of headscarf that they choose depends on their own preference. A lot of times it depends on the family preference, the husband's preference in terms of what they use. Um, so this just kind of gives you an idea. If you use the word hijab, you're, you tend to be okay because that kind of is all encompassing. But if you want to be more specific, this gives you a bit of an idea. All right, so acculturation. Yes? Can you go back? Can you just pronounce the other ones? Sure. <laughs> so if we start at the far right, that would be a chador. And that's a full body cloak that reveals just the eyes or sometimes the face, but it's a full body cloak, so it's all one piece. The hijab, which we talked about, is what you'll typically see. The niqab, I believe, is covers the face and shows only the eyes. The burqa covers the entire body and including the face, so you don't see the eyes. So there's a sheer part over the eyes that allows for them to see, but you don't see any part of that body. And a khamar covers the head, neck, and shoulders, so you only see the, the face again. Yeah. What, what determines um, which one they choose to wear? It really it, it could depend on their own religious preference, and a lot of times it also depends on what their husband's preference is as well. And is this just when they're out in public, like in society, or? If they're in the home and someone comes to the home, they are expected to wear them as well. Is one downcast if for the other if they choose to wear certain ones? Less so in the United States, but more so in their own country. So, of course, they do believe that the more covered you are, the more religious that you are. Um, so in their own countries, that can be, become something of an issue for them. But in the United States, they tend to be a lot more flexible with that. At what age are females supposed to start wearing headscarves? There's no set age. Again, it really depends on the family preference. Um, in some families, you'll see that the, um, the females won't wear them until college. In other families, they may start as early as middle school. So it really depends on the father's preference and the family's preference as a whole. How do the families perceive a woman who wants to pursue a career? They want you to pursue the career. They want you to get the education. It's once you've accomplished that and you get married and you have your first child that it becomes more of an issue for the family. So if um, economically you can afford to stay home, the expectation is that you will prioritize your family and that you will stay home. Um, but some women do prefer or um, feel like they want to continue their careers and that becomes a bit of an issue for their families because again it's individualistic it's very selfish in terms of you're pursuing your own wants and your own needs and not putting your family first Question. Okay. all right so acculturation is defined as a process in which immigrant groups adopt cultural customs ideals ways of life assumptions and practices from the host culture so the level of acculturation really dictates a lot of different things for a family. And a lot of times you'll find that within the same family, the level of acculturation can be very different. So you may um, find that you have a family who immigrates here and their children are high school age children. They may become less acculturated because they've come at an older age. They're more likely to maintain a lot of their um, the Arab culture that they come in with which of course makes things much better for the family and for the mother. But if you're coming to this country and you bring young children who are going to acculturate to the host culture a lot more, it becomes more difficult for the family because the mother is looked at to maintain that culture and the child is now acculturating at a much quicker rate than she is and she's feeling like she's losing control of maintaining that culture within the family. Um, I actually worked with a student who, the family was from an Egyptian background 
Um, they were um, a Muslim family, so the mother wore the hijab. The, the child did not want to wear the hijab. She was in high school, and she tended to want to come to school wearing clothes that for them was a little bit more provocative. And she wanted to have a boyfriend, which for the family is very taboo. Um, and so I'd have the mother come in and say, oh, well, you look Arab. You must be Arab. Are you Arab? And once we had that conversation, she'd be like, okay, she'll listen to you. You need to tell her that she can't do this. You need to tell her that culturally we don't do this. So being able to really support the family with, okay, mom, I hear you, and I hear your cultural um, preferences, and this is what your child's living in. This is the society that she's living with. In how can we find that compromise? Where are you willing to compromise? And where, what is the daughter willing to compromise to come to a level where they can both feel um, okay with the decisions that are being made? Because a lot of times what tends to happen within the Arab children is they hide all the different things that they're doing. So they'll walk out of the house wearing one outfit, change as soon as they get to school, and keep their boyfriends a secret so that the family doesn't know. And the family thinks that everything is perfect and they have this perfect child until somebody from their religious group spots them and then, you know, the child is outed. So, um, and I think nowadays with social media, it makes it even more difficult because kids aren't always perceptive enough to know that if they post something online, their parents will eventually find it. <laughs> so um, it's getting out there quite a bit more. Um, but I work with some um, Arab immigrants who come here, they're middle school, high school age, and their parents tell them, if you're walking down the hallways, you put your head down, you don't talk to a boy, you don't touch them, you don't have any communication with them. Which, of course, if you're in school and you're doing a group project, that's just not possible. Um, but again, culturally, that's the perspective that they're coming in with. When it comes to dating, the expectation is that you will not date. You will wait until you find a guy you want to marry, and then you will get engaged. Which, again, is not very realistic, especially in this country. Because then um, I know women who have had two, three failed engagements because that's the family expectation that's put on them. So it definitely becomes challenging when there's different levels of acculturation within the family. And at what <coughs> age generally does that um, sort of start to shift where there are they are looking for someone to be engaged to? Because I know education is so important. So is it in college? Is it after they graduate from college? Around what time does it usually happen? Again, because the woman's value is placed on her education and her um, ability to find a good match, it's kind of like <laughs> they, they have this battle where it's like, all right, so do, you, do we want our daughter to date while she's in college so that she can find someone, get married as soon as she's done with college, or do we want her to wait? So that's typically a family preference. But um, I noticed that some parents are starting to recognize that children will hide things. So with some education, they are open to, let's have a conversation. I'd rather know what my child is doing than know that they're doing it in secret. It's not always easy. Um, but they're coming around to that because they know that their children will do it anyways. And it's better to be more open about it than not have an idea of what's going on. Yeah. Are there cultural stipulations around how long the engagement should be? So let's say they finish, like, I don't know, college or med school or grad school and they find someone that they're considering marrying, um, is it like, okay, after a year you must get married or? No, not necessarily. If they know that the child has a, a pull towards a certain male to save family, um, per, per, um, to save family image within society, they may say, all right, you guys have to get engaged and this may be early on in college, but they don't want their child to get married until they finish college. So they may be engaged for four years, just so that in terms of society, they see that you guys are an engaged couple. Um, if a family travels with another family and the children are dating and they go back to their countries, so say um, I have a boyfriend and I go back to Egypt with my family and my boyfriend comes, my family will tell everyone that we are engaged because that feels a lot safer than they're just dating. So that's very taboo. The dating is still very much looked down upon, so it's much better to say, well, they're engaged, so it's official, they're, they're good, um, and that makes it much more socially acceptable for them. Okay. So what are some important things to consider in terms of acculturation? So we talked about a few things. So time of immigration, um, when did they immigrate, what was going on, how old were they when they immigrated, um, what was the reason, did they experience trauma in their own countries, were they fleeing something that happened? There's a lot of different stories for how people end up in this country, and we can't assume that we know what it is. So it's really important to ask 
family support. How much family support do they have here? Is it a single father coming by himself, leaving his whole family behind? Um, is it a whole family who's now left the grandparents behind? Are they all coming together? How much family support do they have here? It's very important in terms of knowing how they're going to address and how they're going to acculturate. Um, pre and post immigration experiences. So we've talked a little about some of the stories. Are they coming as um, very wealthy doctors who are now working as gas station attendants? Um, have they experienced racism and discrimination in this country or their own country? Have they experienced trauma? Um, and what's their level of education that they're coming in with? Are they used to working at a certain level and now they're not? So these are all important things to keep in mind. Sorry. Um, I had a child who I worked with in one of the schools and um, he was on the spectrum and he had made a statement in school in order to get along with some of his peers not realizing that this was inappropriate he made a statement that he was going to they put c4s around the school so of course his peers panicked and went to the principal the principal called me in and said you have to screen this child which i did quickly realized that he was on the spectrum and that he wasn't a risk to anyone but again the statements were inappropriate so the father was called in the family was muslim and they were arab and the dad had immigrated to the United States from an Arab country. So he walked in very angry, very upset, not about what his child had said, but automatically asked his child, did anybody ask you if you were Muslim? Did anybody ask you if you're a terrorist? And attacking the school that you're singling him out because of his religious preference, because of his cultural background, completely missing everything else. Now that we were quick to realize that father works as a taxi driver, he was an educated man who had a good job in his country, so there's a good chance that he was experiencing his own racism, his own discrimination. And just earlier that year, in the same city, um, another taxi driver who was, uh, who was of Arab descent was shot in his taxi car. So again, walking in with this defensiveness is a coping mechanism for them. I'm trying to understand what their experience is like requires asking and seeking some information. We can automatically assume, well, that's the type of um, race they are, that they're coming in, and they're defensive, and they're argumentative, but we don't know what their experience was like. We don't know what their story is, and it's really important to understand that. Okay. Um, so a few years ago, they created this movie called A Thousand and One Journey, which really talks about the Arab experience um, with immigrating to the United States. So this is just a quick five minute summary of the video, but I thought it might help kind of summarize a lot of what we've been talking about. My mother was born in 1902 in South Central Lebanon and spent most of her adult life, about 40 years, working the night shift in textile mills. During that time, she raised five children, so I went to the best place in the world. It was really interesting growing up Palestinian in the United States because I kind of knew I was Palestinian before I even knew I was a girl. It was all my dad ever talked about. My dad, Salim, came over with his brother, Amin. They went through Ellis Island and went out to Montana. You think they want to go to Arizona where there's desert. Growing up in Oklahoma, you always have this notion of being Arab American, but at the same time not wanting to be too different. When you come across thousands of miles to come here, it was giving up a major part of your soul, your connection to a land, to a space, to a people. But for me, the values of this country, what it stood for, I felt very connected to and wanted to be a part of. In 1912, my grandfather came to this country to avoid being conscripted into the Turkish army, since he was not a Muslim and he wasn't a Turk. He had no desire to really fight there. When my father said, when I sailed past the Statue of Liberty in 1912, I took it seriously. He meant freedom, freedom to speak out. To him, uh, free speech was the reason for being. A lot of people don't even realize there's Christians in the Middle East. That's the land where Christ himself walked. So we went to Irish schools. Irish Catholic schools, which were torturous because the nuns didn't understand Eastern Rite Catholics. They didn't understand Syrians, period. When I first came to the U.S., I was an organist for 10 years in a church, knowing that I'm a Muslim, and I'm so amazed with, the, uh, with this church decision to embrace a, a human being with a different religion. We're children of Abraham, Christians, Muslims, Jews. Allah means God. Allah, God. If 
if the stern look didn't work. My parents disciplined us with a very wonderful little proverbs, Kirshizir Nas, which means the more you go to excess child, the more you're subtracting from yourself. We were uh, bequeathed the wisdom of the ages. I was born in 1934, where Everybody helped everybody. No one locked their doors. Everybody was poor. Everybody was struggling. If somebody was out of work and they needed food, uh, families would go over and cook for them or take food over. We had a typical kind of relationship with Italians and Poles and Irish. And we grew up with fights on the playground, fights in Little League. On the other hand, we all kind of loved each other. War II came. My dad joined immediately after Pearl Harbor it was a high point for him, and his talk about that really focused me on wanting to be a, an officer in, in the armed forces of the United States. My brother served World War II. My father World War I, and my nephew in Vietnam. We learned to love your God, your family, and your country. Whenever something happens in the Middle East, I was asked questions like, what are you people, or what, do, what are your people doing? And I used to just have to roll my eyes and say, why am I the representative of the entire Arab Middle East? I remember being in college and seeing images of Arabs as terrorists and cab drivers. And I remember thinking, God, they're not even Arabs playing Arabs. You know, and as an Arab American, it's always interesting getting on an airplane. All of a sudden, you're selected for a special search. It happened to me as a retired four-star general that uh, led our forces in the Middle East. December 10th, I went to bed. A white guy, December 11th, I woke up an Arab. 9-11 affected everybody. It affected us not only as Muslims or me as an Arab and a Muslim, but as an American, because this is my country. I'm proud of being Arab American. I, you know, it's something that, that definitely shaped my identity and the career that I chose. It's more important than ever now for us to actually help shape that culture, help shape those notions, that sensibility about who we are. The sooner we do that, the better. We're here. We've been here. We're all the places we should be as contributors to American society. My father told us, if you work hard to get a good education and you're lucky enough to live in America, you really can't fail. But don't forget where you came from. And I believe in the American dream because I've looked at it. different we don't really know what you are I've been asked I've been 
asked if I'm from a lot of different places that are not of Arab um, background. And it's really hard to identify. And so a lot of people just place these assumptions and treat them in certain ways without really taking that time to understand. They don't, a lot of times they won't even ask, what is your religious preference? They just automatically put that assumption on you. They assume where you're from, they assume what you believe, they assume what you practice. And like we saw earlier, even within the different religious practices that they experience, some Arabs choose not to practice their religion. It's very rare, <laughs> but some do. And if we're not asking the right questions, we're making a lot of assumptions about a large group of people without really knowing or understanding them. So it's really important to ask, which I think we can say about any culture that we work with. Um, but if we don't ask, then we don't know. Okay, so I'm going to go through this one very quickly because we already kind of talked about a lot of this. So again, we said that they view mental health diagnoses as punishments. They um, really keep family issues very private and um, don't like that information to be shared outside of the family. Again, we mentioned that they'll go to their religious providers or a physician prior to really seeking mental health services because that just feels um, more selfish to be able to identify yourself as feeling depressed or feeling anxious as opposed to focusing more on the physical symptoms. Um, expression of psychological symptomology. So because the physical is much more comfortable for them, they tend to experience um, emotional symptoms in a physical manner. Um, so it's uncommon for them to use um, affective words such as I feel depressed or I feel um, sad or I feel suicidal. It's much more comfortable to use the physical symptoms. I feel stomach pains. Um, I have high blood pressure, like I mentioned, my back hurts, um, I get migraines. So those are much more acceptable because they're physical symptoms and then they're able to get medication to target the symptoms as opposed to really focus on the emotional piece. Um, they tend to seek out medical help for their physical symptoms. Okay. All right, so what are some counseling considerations? So it's really important to understand our own stereotypes, which again, I think we can say working with any cultural group, it's really important to understand what our own stereotypes are about the culture and how can these affect my um, efficacy as a clinician. Um, it's important to understand issues of acculturation. So again, if we don't ask, we don't know. When it comes to acculturation issues, language can be a big issue. So. Sometimes the whole family unit gets flipped upside down because you have the child who's learned English and the parents who still only speak Arabic. The child is expected to go to all um, important appointments with their parents and translate. They answer all letters and correspondences and they're really kind of taking on this very um, parentified role because they have to. And then when the parent says, no, but you have to listen to my culture and you have to listen to my rules, that can be really challenging for kids because they look at it as, well, I'm the one that's acting as the adult here. I'm the one that's doing everything. Why do I have to listen to you? So being able to understand where the family's at, what are the different um, uh, levels of acculturation, what is the family's understanding of the language, don't assume that they understand you. Um, ask them what language they're most comfortable with. And I know we try not to do this, but sometimes it's unavoidable that we use the child as the translator. Anytime you can avoid using the child as a translator, do it because then you're putting them again in that role where they are above the parent. Um, you're not sure how much of that information they're actually communicating to the parent. They can leave out whatever doesn't sound right to them. Um, <laughs> and a lot of times we assume that the child knows the language as well as the parents do. That's not always the case. So they may have a difficult time translating certain words. So that the, um, the meaning of what you're trying to say doesn't come across correctly. So anytime you can avoid using the child, avoid using the child and get a translator that um, you can help to translate for the family. Sometimes they'll bring their own translators with them. That tends to happen quite a bit. Or they'll bring a family friend or religious leader, um, someone within the family that understands English better, and they'll bring that person with them because that feels more comfortable. So always ask, would you like a translator? Can I get someone that can help us translate? Do you feel more comfortable? Um, I think if you talk to most people who English is, the, is their second language, there's certain words that just don't translate into English. So when it comes to trying to explain how I'm feeling or what my experience is, there's certain words that I want to use in my predominant language that don't translate into English. So even if I speak English very well, 
there's certain things that I might want to say in my um, original language. So just kind of figuring out with them what do they feel most comfortable with. Um, understand their um, cultural factors by asking them. And we talked about that mistrust of professionals, mistrust of the country as a whole at times. You know, of what was their experience like? Have they been discriminated against? Have they had situations where they felt unsafe? Being able to understand that helps you understand where they're coming from. A lot of times we assume their defensiveness is because they're being rude or they don't, um, they don't um, have that respect for the authority. That's not the case. They actually have significant respect for authority and they are very big on using labels. They will call you the doctor even if you're not a doctor. <laughs> um, if they're coming to see you and they know that you're a professional, then you're the doctor. And they really value what you have to say so it's really important that we then um, extend that back to them and have respect for their culture and understand what their experience is like. And the only way to do that is to ask them. They'll never be um, offended if you want to understand them better. That will actually make them feel like you care. Um, the Arab Americans' indirect and non-specific matter should not be perceived as resistance. And again, that goes back to that defensiveness. Okay, so we've talked a lot about the collectivistic society. So trying to leave the family out of the work makes them feel like you don't understand them and you don't understand their culture. Don't get me wrong, sometimes the kids will want absolutely nothing to do with the parents in the room because of that differences in levels of acculturation. But it's very disrespectful as far as the family is concerned if you leave the family completely out of the work. So doing some education early on with the family and helping them understand why it's important to meet with their child individualistically goes, or individually goes a long way. It helps them understand what your purpose is. Um, again, that feeling of mistrust, they may feel that you're meeting with their child individually so you can tell their child that everything they're doing is right and go against everything that the family has said. So really kind of assuring the family, I understand your culture, I understand your preferences, I understand your needs, and then taking that time to say, I need to meet with your child individually so that your child trusts me and we can work together to come up with compromises that work for both of you goes a very long way. Um, issues of temporality. So we, in the Egyptian culture, go on Egyptian standard time. And if <laughs> weddings can start three hours late and nobody blinks, um, that's not to be perceived as um, as them being um, resistant to the treatment. However, it can definitely pose issues, so this is something that they can be educated upon. It's important to put boundaries in place. Just know that they're not coming from a place of being resistant, as we've been taught through all of our psychology courses, that really it's just their culture. and Culturally, they're not a very time-bound um, culture. <laughs> um, the importance of clients' religion in your work. Um, it's important to ask what their religion is. Do not assume. Um, some will ask you what your religious preference is. Sometimes it makes them feel more comfortable, although I have worked very um, effectively with individuals of Arab culture who are Muslim, so that won't necessarily mean that they will not work with you. They just want to know that you are understanding them and want to take the time to understand them and their religious preferences and their culture. And if you are not asking questions or not showing that you're interested, then they will automatically become defensive and feel like you are already um, placing stigma on them or are prejudiced against them because of their religious beliefs. So it's important to ask questions. Okay. So selection of treatment modality. So again, because they're more focused on the physical ailments, um, CBT tends to work very well. Short-term therapies tend to be preferred because they want you to focus on the issues, treat the issues, and then they move on. They're not ones that are going to enjoy psychodynamic therapy where you go into detail about all their feelings and their childhood and how their relationship with their mother is affected, how they're um, experiencing different things today. They don't want to go there. They don't want to understand it. They just want you to fix the physical ailments so that they can um, not have to deal with that and then move on with their lives. So um, that's just important to keep in mind. The shorter the treatment, the better. These are not individuals who are going to stay in therapy for years and um, enjoy that process. They really want you to just focus on the symptoms, help them treat the symptoms so that they can move on. Any questions? Okay. 
So these are some helpful books. Um, I'm sorry I didn't bring them with me, but um, so that you guys have them. They um, give you some inform more information about the culture. They give you information about counseling considerations to use with the culture. But one thing I didn't put in there. Um, Egyptians are not a culture that tends to have poor eye contact. They tend to have very good eye contact. And um, they have, um, they enjoy being close. So sometimes um, personal space becomes a bit of an issue. That's, um, that's a cultural piece. Um, so for example, if my mother-in-law is over, we wake up in the morning, she's going to hug me and kiss me twice. We're going to, if we split up to go get ready for dinner, same thing. We meet up again after before dinner, same thing, and again at the end of the night. So it's the, the sense of touch, the sense of closeness is something that's important to them. Um, that doesn't mean you're going to hug and kiss all your clients. That's just something to understand about the culture. Um, it tends to feel more uncomfortable with the male and female. So females with females, males with males, they tend to prefer um, therapists that are, their, that are of their own um, gender background. That feels a little bit more comfortable for them. Um, any questions? Yeah. So I worked with a child a while back who um, was a middle school student, and she was, um, and she was, uh, her family was Arab. They were also Muslim. Uh, the father was very traditional. He wanted her to wear um, a hijab to school, and she was very distraught about it, actually. And you know, was getting teased and was feeling embarrassed and didn't want to, and that was sort of one of the reasons that precipitated the episode that caused her to come to the hospital. Um, and in the process of working with the family, what ended up sort of happening was that the mom and the daughter, you know, kind of made a deal, right? We, in our first meeting, the father was like, "This is what she has to do, end of story." But as the day progressed, it was sort of like, "You don't have to. It'll just be between us. We won't tell your dad." And in a case where normally we would not, we wouldn't sort of support like a side deal. <laughs> we would want the whole family to be involved. But we kind of made the decision that that was probably best for their family dynamic, that if the child felt best, you know, she felt better, her mom understood, her mom kind of gave her a little bit of leeway, and they kind of both agreed to keep it from the dad. And as a team, we kind of stood back and let them work that through. Do you have any thoughts about that scenario and yeah. or if there's something else that should be done in a situation like that? No, I think uh, that's actually very typical of the culture. Mm -hmm. Because again, the mom's um, expected to maintain that culture and if the child is doing well, then the mother is doing well. So it, the child tends to be a lot more comfortable sharing certain things with the mother because the mother can then keep that information with the father. Again, we're saying that the mothers tend to be home Fathers tend to have to work a lot of hours in order to support the family if you have a, um, a single um, income family. So the mother will do that in order to maintain the peace within the home. The mothers are more likely to understand that I want my child to be happy, I want my child to be safe, I want my child to not feel uncomfortable in school. So if that means having to keep certain things from the father, um, make certain deals with the child, they are actually able to do that. Um, and certain information doesn't get back to the dad. Which again, we want to make sure that the dad doesn't end up getting that information at some point because that can be very bad for the child. Mm -hmm. There's been situations where I've worked with the parent, the child where the mother will agree to certain things, the dad finds out, and then mom must side with dad at that point. So once dad becomes in the know, it's very hard for the mom to support the child over the father. Um, and for whatever reason within the culture, they're very quick to say, well, if you keep doing this, I'm sending you back to your country of origin. You're going to go live with your grandma. And um, a lot of times helping them educate them on you can't make these empty threats because your child's eventually going to get to the point where they know that you don't mean it. Um, does it happen sometimes? Yes. It's not very common. Because they're such a collectivistic society, the idea of leaving your child and sending your child back to their country of origin and having them leave your family unit tends to be very distressing for the family, so they tend to make the threat much more than they actually mean it. Um, but again, they're willing to, they want their children to be happy. So if they see that their child is going to continue to push away and continue to become iller because of decisions that they're making, they'd rather sit and really come up with a compromise that works for everyone than to lose their child, more so the mother than the father. 
but a lot of times in this work, you're going to find that the mother's the one showing up. If the child is in the hospital, if the child, um, I had, a, I, I worked with a, I, actually I shouldn't say I worked with, but a colleague of mine worked with the child and we consulted quite a bit who was in JJC. So the child had um, engaged in behaviors that got him into prison and it was the mother that would show up. It was the mother that would need to continue to see the child. The father pretty much shut him out. You're, we're, I'm done with you for now because you have put shame on the family. The mom, the children are her heart, so she's not going to stop supporting and caring for her child. And so she's more likely to do what she needs to do to make sure that her children are happy and safe, even if it makes, means making some compromises. So even that um, teenage girl I told you guys about earlier on, the mom knew that she was dating. So it got to the point where the mom was even willing to compromise on that to not lose her child. If you must date, okay, but he needs to come to the house. I don't want you guys going out on your own. I want to know what's going on. I want to be able to see that you are safe. So the mom was willing to come to a place where I am willing to compromise to know that my daughter is safe and my daughter is happy than for me to allow her to do everything behind my back. Parents are not stupid. They're very smart. Once they know what's going on, they know what's going to continue going on. Um, so they're willing to make those compromises in order to keep their children happy and safe. Do the older siblings have a role in, in the therapeutic process at all? Yes, it's a whole family unit. So if the siblings are around, um, you know, if they're not in college or whatnot, they definitely will want to play a part in it. Um, but again, it's important to ask, what is the preference? What would you like? Who would you like to be in the room? If we don't ask, we don't know. A lot of times the older siblings tend to take on a more paternal or parentified role with their siblings. They're expected to help out and make sure that their siblings are living their lives culturally correct according to the family. So including them in that process keeps everyone on the same page. Well, um, these are some references. And uh, if you guys think of anything, you can always reach out to me. Um, I'm available via email. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions, and I thank you for your time.